also the people can come in if there are people waiting. Um, um, we, hello, Carolina, welcome. Hello. Do we have all speakers? Yes. Yes, we are full. Thank you, Carolina, for joining. Um, Carolina, um, you will present some slides, right? Yes. Yes, okay. although I'm wondering if I should, because um, it will be a bit unbalanced. Mark is also presenting slides. OK. So you know how to share your screen. Yes, normally, yes. And if it's possible, could you share afterwards the slides with me? Yeah. Sure. And could we upload them in our website? Yes. Thank you very much I'll for that. Send you by email, yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm the only one without slides then, right? You can do mine if you like. <laughs> that helps. Alberto, you can, do you want to pull some slides? One or two? I will maybe use one in that case, yes. Okay, okay. Just it's just really one for the one or two for the introductory statement. Exactly. I think a visual aid, it always helps the audience who may perhaps do not know you, who you are, and just just a visual aid. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I, I will make you present at the end so you can uh, prepare the slides. It's not, don't worry, I can even, however you, you prefer. Okay. Okay, it's nine, so either you can start. People are coming in, so it's fine. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our panel on biodiversity. We live within and depend on biological diversity, but, uh, but as our climate, we're deeply concerned about the global rate of biodiversity loss, the over-exploitation of natural resources, the way we use land and sea, pollution and invasion alien species are some examples of concern. Moreover, as Minister Sakya Katabi reminded us yesterday, biodiversity loss is an opportunity for pathogens or emerging infectious diseases to pass from vertebrate animals to humans. The key point here is that biodiversity and climate change are of similar magnitude. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo, Senior Researcher at the European Trade Union Institute, and today I'm delighted to be your host. But before we get started, I would like to introduce our experts. Carolina de Cuna, she is a Deputy Head of Unit of the Environment. Marco, he is the CEO of Capitals Coalition. Alberto Arroyo Schnell, he is a Senior Policy Manager at the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And before we dive into our panel conversation, let's get familiarized with our panelists. They will present short introductory statements. Carolina de Cuna, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. If there is a problem, please let me know. I will try to present some slides um, as an introductory statement. Just going to do that now. I hope it works. Can you see the slides? Okay, great. Uh, so yes, good morning everyone. My name is Carolina Dacuna, as uh, introduced uh, by AIDA, I'm um, Deputy Head of Unit that deals with biodiversity in the European Commission. Um, and my unit is part of a directorate that uh, is responsible for natural capital. And earlier this year, uh, well actually, uh, that was already last year, uh, in May last year, we have um, adopted um, a biodiversity strategy for 2030, uh, which is uh, aimed at uh, setting um, out biodiversity action for the next decade. 
Um, I think it's important to place this strategy within the broader context of uh, this Commission landmark initiative, the European Green Deal. Um, and that will help you understand why biodiversity is uh, important for uh, the Commission um, these days. It has always been important, but not as it is today, I would say. Uh, the Green Deal deals with major existential threats, I would say, that we are all facing, the ecological crisis that has multiple facets and biodiversity loss is just one of them, but they are all very strongly linked. So we are losing biodiversity and that means that we are facing extinctions of various species, animals, plants, uh, but we are also losing the variety of life on earth. And that is another big problem because we cannot survive if we have only very limited variety of species. Um, but we will probably talk about that a little bit later. Another part of the big, big crisis and also one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss is climate change. It's getting warmer. Species are not able to adapt to such a quick global warming. Uh, and climate change, so they are not coping well. We see uh, big uh, changes in how species react um, and uh, um, that uh, triggers the disappearance. On the other hand, one of the most efficient tools to fight climate change, to absorb carbon, are plants. And these um, is a sort of a catch-22 situation. So on the one hand, we're losing life on Earth. On the other hand, it's getting warmer, which accelerates the loss of life. So that is indeed a very worrying trend. Um, protecting nature, therefore, is a big part of, um, of the fight against climate change. Um, it is a big part of the Commission's policy to mitigate and also to adapt to climate change. Um, and of course, that cuts across various policies uh, because protecting nature, uh, restoring nature will have to do with pretty much everything we do with our lifestyles. And that's why it's also linked to policies such as circular economy. So trying to reuse, recycle, put back all the materials that we have extracted from earth, not to generate waste um, so that we don't need to use more land. They don't need to encroach again on uh, the, 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 the limited amount of land that we have left for nature on this planet. Uh, and many other policies, transport policies, food policies, food is a very important factor in, uh, in this uh, uh, work. So now very briefly uh, going through the, some facts and figures um, biodiversity and ecosystems are deteriorating worldwide. It's not uh, limited to, to Europe, although in Europe we have uh, pretty much eradicated um, wildlife uh, in the past decades. It's, it's richer in, uh, in other countries, but it's deteriorating quite rapidly. Uh, there's very little land and sea on earth that's not been altered by humans. Um, three quarters of terrestrial ecosystems and 40% of marine environment have been severely altered by our actions. Um, more than 70% of uh, earth's land that is not covered by ice is shaped by human activity. So there's very little left. Um, and even that is affected by pollution and climate change. Now, there is a big problem with deforestation. We're losing the lungs of the planet. So we're losing the capacity to, to, to provide oxygen. Um, that is also happening in the oceans, which are producing a lot of oxygen and uh, are warming up. So they're also um, losing that capacity. Um, and in the EU, if we zoom into the European Union, uh, since the 90s, we have lost a third of all our farmland birds. These are just some indicators to show you the scale of uh, degradation. We have lost 40% of grassland butterflies, which has disappeared. 
And in some parts of the EU, we have lost up to 80% of pollinating insects. Now, if we don't have pollinating insects, we don't have food that pollination depends on. Um, so you can see that really the anthropogene has triggered that uh, action. The industrial revolution started it. And you have uh, in that graph on the right hand side, a very clear depiction of how rapidly we have started to kill life in, on the planet uh, since 1900s. The main drivers of these uh, um, laws are the, the use of land and sea. So uh, basically our encroachment on uh, land and sea, uh, direct exploitation of natural resources. Then of course, climate change, which has moved up that scale. It's now the third biggest driver of uh, biodiversity loss. And then pollution uh, and invasive alien species. So species that arrive to the um, habitats and ecosystems where they normally don't belong and then compete with um, um, species that lived there. Um, um, they're more adaptable to, to climatic, changing climatic conditions and so on and so forth and are a very strong competition. Um, that is quite important also in the sense of our economy. And I think the other speakers will probably talk about it a little bit more. Uh, so I will just present to you uh, what we call a wedding cake uh, depiction of the sustainable uh, development goals. We depend on biosphere, all our food, uh, all our um, resources, the, the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, we get it from nature. Um, the medicines, um, all sorts of other services that nature provides. And we believe, I think, that it comes for free and we can exploit it exponentially. Well, that is unfortunately not true. And we are starting to uh, feel also the economic consequences of that damage. Um, it is important to bear in mind that um, also our, our growth depends on nature. So if we um, eradicate nature, uh, we will basically stop um, growing. It will affect us financially, economically, um, and so on. Um, now, Move to the next slide, um, which is the biodiversity strategy. I will try not to talk about it too much because I, I'm conscious that I'm passing over my uh, short introduction. Um, but I mean, it's, it all sounds very gloomy and like despairing. What can we do? Is it too late? And should we just accept it? Well, we believe, and I think there's consensus around the world uh, because it's not only the commission, we, we follow the trend of really big, important global studies by, um, by the UN, by WTO, by, by very renowned um, scientific institutes uh, on that. Um, but we believe that it's not too late. And I think it is also quite known what needs to be done. But I also have to say it's not easy because it has to do with the transformative change of the way we uh, live, we uh, consume and we produce. Uh, we have structured the strategy around four parts. Um, the first one is about protecting nature. So we really need to protect what is left. Um, the second part is about restoring nature. So where it has been lost, we should bring it back to a good state um, and that also allows coexistence of uh, our economic activities with nature. And then we have two parts on how to go about it. So enabling that transformative change through various policy measures. And finally, crucially, what should we do as the EU to um, trigger that change globally, which is extremely complex uh, because of um, varying um, levels of uh, income of, because of diversity uh, in economic uh, de development, different cultures, different type of nature, different type of resources around the world. Uh, 
But this year we will have a very big conference of the parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity that will set a similar agenda for biodiversity globally for the coming decade. Um, on protecting nature, we propose to protect a third of land and sea in the EU. And we want to base this on uh, the existing network of protected areas that is called Natura 2000. It's more difficult on sea because there we have less protected areas, but it should be relatively easy to achieve on land. And the second element of that is that we need to connect those protected areas so that species and nature can move uh, across uh, that network and that we don't create isolated islands of, um, of biodiversity. Uh, we also want to strictly protect the sort of jewels in the crown. So the areas which are of very high value for biodiversity or areas that are very important for climate change adaptation mitigation, such as, for instance, peatlands or old growth forests. Um, so that's on nature protection. Now uh, we have a very big part devoted uh, to nature restoration in the strategy. And there we're trying to propose uh, commitments or targets for different um, types of ecosystems. So um, we, it's a bit of a mixture of, um, of different policy measures that we propose to the member states, um, ranging from increasing organic farming and introducing uh, landscape features to farms. So parts of farms that would host life, such as pollinators, uh, reducing the use of pesticides, um, planting additional trees. I think this is now quite um, a common action in, in, in pretty much uh, every corner of the world. Uh, reducing the risk um, of pollution from fertilizers, um, actions to reverse the decline of pollinators, um, actions on soil to remediate soils, um, actions on restoration of free flowing rivers, so removing obsolete dams and barriers so that uh, the flow can um, be restored. We propose new measures for greening cities uh, or uh, to encourage cities to, um, to um, green themselves. Um, and targets also for, um, for the marine areas. Now, of course, uh, these are political targets. They're not legally binding as such, uh, but they will guide, for instance, commission spending uh, from our uh, common agricultural policy, from our structural funds, regional funds. Um, one of the actions that we proposed is a new legislative uh, instrument on um, nature restoration, and we are now uh, working on that. And many other actions as well. So um, this is pretty much the end of my presentation. I just uh, will go very quickly through the last uh, slides. Um, we uh, have to set up some sort of a governance framework to make all this happen. Uh, because it will not materialize itself. We have to work with stakeholders. We have to work with uh, member states to, to do that. Um, the commission is working very intensely on unlocking financing for uh, nature. We, we propose that we will spend 20 billion euro annually on uh, biodiversity. And there's a number of very different actions that we will conduct with business um, on the knowledge side to promote so-called nature-based solutions, so solutions inspired by nature that help us uh, fight with, for instance, climate change. Um, and then uh, later this year, now uh, we will go to China if COVID allows us to do that, uh, to negotiate the global biodiversity framework which we would like to be inspired by what we did in Europe, what we proposed in Europe. Um, and we will see how that, um, how that works. Um, the negotiations are going to start pretty soon. We're talking to, to our partners already. 
um, but in the online context is a little bit um, it's a little bit new to everyone it's a bit more complicated um, than going to one place uh, and uh, conducting the, the usual negotiations um, but it will be crucial it will be crucial what we decide globally um, and um, I will now stop uh, to let the other speakers talk. Uh, these are the main uh, targets, just a sample of targets that we proposed. Um, and I will be happy to discuss uh, with you um, further on what your thoughts are about it um, and what the contribution could be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina de Cuna, and uh, thank you for showing us the big picture of the European Commission. Let's go to Mark Roch, uh, uh, CEO of Capital Coalitions. Mark, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. And I believe I've got a couple of slides which are going to appear any second. So my name is Mark Goff. I'm the CEO of a Dutch foundation called the Capitals Coalition, which unites a group of people around the world around redefining our understanding of value and it was great to see Carolina just a moment ago talk about The Wedding Cake by Pavan Sukhev and Johan Rockstrom. You can see that on the wall just behind me here as well. So that's something that defines our work here. So if we can just go to the next slide. The Capitals Coalition, um, as I said, was formed at Rio Plus 20. It's been connecting up people around the world. And the premise behind this, I think building on what Carolina was just saying there, is that we've got these three major challenges. We've got nature loss, climate change, and inequality, which is a key part of that. And because our decisions are currently based on the information that we have, and I sit on lots of boards and things like that, and I get the information in financial terms, I don't get the information in a term that might say why nature is important or people are important. It tells me the financial reasons. And because we exclude that, I think that's why we're really not taking the steps that we should do. And we've got lots of initiatives. There's some brilliant initiatives in the EU and around the world to try and tackle these three things, but we're not seeing the mainstreaming changes that we need to because of this. And that, for my mind, is because we're not using this concept of capitals, that we're not including nature and people in our decision making. And I think that a lot of us, if we went back a year ago, we're still talking about 2020. We're all talking about 2030 now. We can't keep on pushing this forward a year, a 10 years, 10 years. This really is the last opportunity for us to do this, seeing all those figures that Carolina was telling us about biodiversity loss and the inequality that we've seen that's come through, particularly through COVID, that has been highlighted, and climate change, obviously, there's another big COP this year, obviously, in the UK, that's gonna be covering that as well. So we have got to do something about this now. So how do we do this? If we can go to the next slide. So capitals, there's four major capitals that are used. Now, some people talk about six, some people talk about five or seven, it doesn't really matter. What we're really talking about here is thinking about something that if we invest in it, we get a return. So in the same way as if you invest your money, you expect a return in it. If we invest in nature, we get a return from that. So natural capital, human capital, social capital, produced capital, they're the stocks. They're something that we need to keep on looking after, protecting, restoring, as Carolina was saying there, making sure that we're protecting all of those. If we do that, then we get a flow of benefits. And those benefits come through such as the ecosystem services, so the pollinators, the human capitals, so the capabilities in our workforce, social capital, that cooperation, the trust, the law, the empowerment that we um, provide. And in fact, that's exactly what we do as an organization. We create those communities. We create that social capital. And then the produced capital. And we started as the Natural Capital Coalition, working very closely with Carolina and her team. We then realized that that group of people needed to find solutions that were engaging with people. You couldn't just do it on nature alone. So we set up a social and human capital coalition, which included the trade unions, included um, the International Labour Organization and some of the charities like Oxfam. And then quite quickly, they realized also that they needed to connect with the environment. You can't do people without the environment. So what we did last year is we've united all of this together into one integrated whole. And the really interesting thing for me is, is if you do a study or you start looking at the impacts and dependencies from one of these capitals, you get one answer. If you look at them individually and you do a natural capital assessment, a human capital, a social and produced, and you add them together, you get a different answer, but you get an even different answer if you integrate them. Because actually, as you do one, all of the others change. 
And we live in a system, nature, biodiversity teaches us this, we can't survive without all of the other things around us. And therefore it's as a system, it's as an integrated whole that we need to make these decisions. Now that feels rather complex, it feels rather difficult, but there are lots of tools, there's a big community out there that is looking to try and address this. And there's lots of advancements that have been going on. I'm sure you've heard about um, the Prince of Wales recently launched the Terra Carta for the Earth. We've got lots of other projects, including a really important one in the EU, which is called Align. So last year, there were um, up to 16 different projects to try and identify a metrics for biodiversity. Now, we don't need 16. We need one that we're all using consistently. So what we're doing at the moment as an EU project is we're bringing together all of those people that have been involved in those projects and we're standardizing that into the accounting rules. That's gonna be doing it for the biodiversity project. There's also another project we're doing with the EU called Transparent, which is looking at air, water and land. And then we add in the biodiversity from a line and we've got all of that natural capital in standardized processes that we can then use to make decisions. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Mark. And our last expert uh, is Alberto Arroyo Schnell, Senior Policy Manager at the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Please, Alberto, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I, I think that you know that uh, typically said that you need to repeat something like three to five times if you want that they remember it. I think we have been successful here because the three of us are using the same slide here in relation with the sustainable development goals wedding cake. This is simply to show how important is nature in all the equation of sustainable development. This is the base of it. If we don't start from it, we will have real challenges to achieve the social and economic goals. But let me start with a short story about uh, an event that happened, I think, a couple of years ago in the Netherlands. It was an event about agriculture, and there was a farmer there, a Dutch farmer. And he was speaking about his farm, who in, he inherited from his father, and his father inherited from his grandfather. His grandfather was uh, very keen to ensure that the farm that he was leaving to his father will be in a better state than he received it. And his father was also very keen in making this happen to his son. They both, they both succeeded. Now, the farmer that I'm speaking about, he was saying about his farm that he was not going to leave the farm in a better state to the next generation, especially because of environmental reasons related with soil health, etc. Well, this reminds also to the fact that we are now often hearing that our children are not going to live better than we live. This is as uh, very well spotted in this conference. We need a new social and ecological contract for the future. We are living very challenging times now with the COVID crisis. Uh, it's affecting the job market. There are a huge amount of jobs in jeopardy. The pandemic is actually going to end up in a social and economic crisis, as we know. And this is joined with the crisis that we already have, the climate crisis and the biodiversity loss crisis. And by the way, let us remember, this is not just an environmental issue. It, has a, it is a fundamental social and economic issue. We know coming back to agriculture that biodiversity loss can result in reduced crop yields and fish catches, increased losses from flooding and other disasters, and of course the loss for the potential new sources for medicines. Environment is crucial for our health also, not only physical health, but also our mental health. Well, all this is a little bit of a negative start, and you might get the impression that uh, I can, I may be coming here with a number of prophecies about the terrible future. I work for the International Union for Conservation of the Nature, and that's maybe sometimes what we can hear sometimes from the ecologic side, if you want. Mm -hmm. Nothing further from the truth, anyway. I am very positive, and I think that we have a number of reasons to be a bit optimistic. I agree also with what Carolina was saying about the moment we are living. We have a, a situation that is much better from the past and not the far away past, actually. I would say that only five years ago, it will be much more difficult to speak about biodiversity than how it is nowadays. We even hear it, it at very high political levels. The world biodiversity was difficult to hear in speeches from politicians at high level some years ago. And actually, if you hear it, maybe it was not exactly for the good of biodiversity. Now it's very, very different. There is also a very high awareness of biodiversity, this conference itself. Well, I do not think that the European trade unions were discussing about biodiversity a lot in the past. Now to see it in the agenda is already very positive, I would say. 
There is also a big political momentum for the environment. The European Green Deal that Carolina was mentioning before, well, this includes also the biodiversity study, but also the farm to fork study, a circular economy action plan. There is a number of actions that are positive. The EU has also showed uh, signs of uh, ambition in relation with the budget. There is an agreed annual 7.5% spending on biodiversity to be increased to 10%. All these are very positive signs. And very recently, only last week, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was uh, speaking about the recent EU environmental policy developments. And in this context, he mentioned that we are ready to, bro we are ready to broker the same ambition at global level because we need a Paris-style agreement for biodiversity. Well, looking forward for that to happen, because at the very end, there is a number of actions that still need to happen. This is, if you want a little bit, the but. All these are very good plans for now, but we need to see really good implementation. Here, national and subnational levels are, of course, crucial, but also we need to see the resources, the resources to make it happen, the budget. Also, the common agricultural policy, the CAP, is a good example. It's a policy that will need to be aligned with all the new EU relevant plans, in particular, the Green Deal. Because the Green Deal is a great opportunity to make things differently in the European Union. And also, the COVID-19 crisis uh, is, it can be seen as an opportunity. We are going to need to rebuild for now following these terrible consequences. Well, this could be used as an opportunity to rebuild, to recover, to restore better. The current pandemic ultimately actually is highlighting how disastrous the impact of a sick planet can be in our society. So we can be clear, protecting biodiversity means ultimately protecting our society, our well-being, ourselves. So let me conclude with another slide. Simply, this is the risks that uh, landscape, uh, according to the World Economic Forum from last year. What you see on the left is 2010 and on the right, 2020. And you see the different colors. I'm not going to describe, not even read what is there. But you see that the green is getting momentum to the right. And at the very end, practically everything is green. Well, the risks, uh, how the perceived risk and the likelihood of these risks nowadays is clearly into the environmental arena. And biodiversity loss, by the way, is mentioned in both as the likelihood and impact. So as said, we have all the conditions to make things better. Now we just need to make it happen. Thank you very much for the three of you for this introductory statements. And before we get into the questions that already our audience are writing down on the questions and answers, which are very precise, let's go and uh, speak a, bit, a little bit about what you said, Alberto, the need of good implementation and resources to make the European Green Deal happen. So in your view, what is the link between the EU biodiversity strategy and the European Green Deal? Uh, some commentators said that there is no common target. So how do you see their implementation and the, the resources to make these both big strategies happen? Well, uh, let's just remember that the biodiversity study is part of the Green Deal. So we are, if we want to achieve the Green Deal, we need to achieve the biodiversity study. That's a, a condition. Uh, I was mentioning before that at the moment we have a number of opportunities of uh, changing plans. And one of them is one of the fundamental ones, I would say, is the budget discussion that is happening now. And in particular, one special policy that is very, very important for the rural areas and for the environment, which is the common agricultural policy. It is being discussed at the very moment. The common agricultural policy proposal is previous to the European Green Deal. So in a way, it's not exactly aligned. Now there is an opportunity with this discussion to make it align. I will say that if that happens, we have done a major step in the right direction. Carolina or Mark, would you like to jump on that? Yes, I think um, I, I, I could maybe add a little bit to that. Um, the Green Deal is a sort of a compass for the Commission uh, and for all the policies uh, that it guides all the policies. It might not uh, be that visible when you read the text from the outside, but in fact, internally, the impact of the Green Deal on what we do is quite profound. So whatever we propose, however we implement uh, the policies, um, 
and the legislation has to have that in mind. So, for instance, we are now uh, we we have now finished discussing the next uh, multi-annual financial framework, which is the budget for the EU for the coming years. And the main point um, there was how to make the budget greener, so that we now direct the money to the investments that implement the policies of the Green Deal, uh, or at least, at the very least, do no harm. So you cannot finance something that will contribute to biodiversity loss. That will not be possible. You don't see that very well, maybe, when you read the political text, but this is, in fact, happening. Um, the same is with any new legislation that we're proposing, anything that is coming out now. For instance, we are now waiting for the forest strategy. We are now way over that. I'm talking really about my discipline, but it's also about less related uh, areas, um, such as even those linked, for instance, to digitalization. The strategies, the policies that come in the area of digitalizing Europe also have that Green Deal philosophy engraved in them. So they have to see how they can contribute to fighting climate change, to helping biodiversity, etc. It might not be obvious there, but um, it has to be reflected upon. Um, and the last uh, thing, um, I'm not sure about that comment that there is no common target uh, between the Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy, but the, bio the Green Deal has a, um, a chapter that deals with biodiversity. It announces the biodiversity strategy to be, uh, to be developed and it has followed from the Green Deal. Uh, it basically laid, laid out more detail on how we are going to implement the Green Deal. Um, and the same, uh, the same goes for uh, the climate pact and the, uh, the farm to fork strategy, for example. So um, I would say the, the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategies are sort of daughters or sons <laughs> of the Green Deal, um, but they followed very closely on what was announced in the first 100 days of the von der Leyen Commission in the Green Deal. Can I just step in quickly on that? Is that okay? So um, I, I think within any organization, there is always um, some slight differences within departments. I've worked in lots of businesses over the years and you'll find the risk department is doing something slightly different to the finance department, to the uh, you know sustainability department. There's always gonna be slightly different approaches that are taken. I think that we should stop worrying about whether there's differences in these things and actually start looking at the commonalities. And the reason we're, we're actually in a really good place that, that actually we have a green deal, a biodiversity strategy, a farm to fork, all of these things are all going to be important. The taxonomy that's come through for businesses, the work that the EFRAG is doing, all of this comes under the, the reasons that we were setting out before, the whole wedding cake and what we need to act now. So actually, all of these people are engaging with each other. There might be a slightly different opinion on how we do certain things but we're all heading towards being nature positive. We all want to address inequality. We all want to address climate change. And we need different tools in that toolbox. We don't go and hit a, a screw with a hammer. You don't uh, you know, do a nail with a screwdriver. We need to have different approaches. So I think we should stop being too hard on ourselves about how there being different approaches, accept some of those differences and look at the commonality that we've got to push forward here. And I think Europe is definitely the global leader in this. And there's an awful lot that can be learned. There's, I'm seeing a lot in Canada at the moment. that is starting to build up at the moment and following a lot that's going on in the Europe. In Europe, we've seen in we've got New Zealand from the perspective of what we're doing, Iceland and Scotland, all being led by women, just to point that out as well. And they are all leading on well-being accounts and understanding nature and people in the way that they do their policy drivers. So I think there is a lot of commonality that we should be very um, pleased with at the moment as well. All right, thank you for, for these comprehensive answers. And I would like to take a couple of questions from our audience, which is, uh, they are a little bit more uh, go into the point of the debate. Ulf Jarnafjord, he says that many countries replace fossil fuels with bioenergy. And in other sectors, they also want to replace CO2 emissions with, with bioeconomy. And we see also uh, within this OECD 
uh, projects on bioeconomy are very much uh, being sponsored. So a question for the three of you, do you think that this is a sustainable strategy and how, is, how do you view CO2 emissions from combustion? How should they be counted in the emissions statistics? For example, how to handle green carbon, carbon atoms and how is the biodiversity affected by this strategy? Perhaps I can start, but I have to, from, from, from the beginning, uh, explain that I'm not an expert in uh, counting carbon emissions. Um, so uh, that would probably require someone from our directorate uh, general that deals with climate um, change. Um, from the biodiversity perspective, we are quite cautious about um, replacing um, carbon energy with green energy. Of course, it's, uh, um, it's got undeniable overall benefits, but it has to be done in a clever and intelligent way so that we don't undermine biodiversity. So we we, we, we improve the situation on the climate side on the one hand, and then we, um, we um, contribute to uh, another massive problem on the other side. Um, if you um, plant monocultural forests, cut them down and burn uh, these and call it green energy, it's not necessarily the most sustainable way. Uh, to, to deal with the problem of climate change, because then you, uh, you undermine biodiversity in that area. So there, there are certain connections that we have to be um, very careful uh, about. Um, and when planning uh, energy policies, uh, they have to be um, very carefully considered. Thank you, Alberto Mark. Matt, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, to my mind, I mean, this is there is a lot of complexity in this, and what we often do is we take one issue and we try and look at that, and we get experts in it. And uh, since the industrial revolution, I mean, I had someone say the other day that we've been in recession since the industrial revolution. Here, really, um, when you look at it, if you include natural, social, and human capital there. But since then, we've become more and more specialized in what we do. And I think the challenge is here is seeing it as a system. Um, and there is tools, uh, there are tools that we can use, such as the capitals approach. So we do do an awful lot of work with organizations to help them to understand those unintended consequences that might come from those biofuels. And there are places where it does make sense to do it. And there are places where it doesn't. And I think that the, I'd come back down to the point that if we don't have the information to make those decisions, then we will make the wrong decision at times. So we can use natural social human capital to help us to understand where it would make sense to use biofuels, bioenergy, and where it would not make sense um, in the con in, on the concept of nature, people, and the planet. Yes, uh, from my side, uh, well, I want to remind uh, of a very recent uh, report from the Commission, actually, from last week, uh, concluding that the most forest, the most forest biomass produce more greenhouse gas emissions than coal, oil, and gas. So we have to be careful here. This is the most important point. That is not necessarily a, a bullet, a, sil a silver bullet by far. Now, what is also important is that we are speaking about two environmental priorities and two huge crises, climate, climate change, and biodiversity loss. So we are probably in the best situation if we try to look for solutions that are helpful for both and also at the same time for social and for economic reasons. Here I want to raise one concept that was also mentioned by Carolina before, the nature-based solutions. This is probably a good way to explore for the future. And there is a very recent standard from our organization, from IUCN, on the nature-based solutions that can help to identify which of these solutions can really be called nature-based solutions and can really be helpful. So here there are tools that also can help us to develop these solutions in a way that are helpful for both climate and biodiversity, but also social and economically relevant. Can I just add Ada, there as well that the, the nature-based solutions, it's often seen um, that you'll hear these different phrases. I've just been talking about capitals. We've just been hearing about nature-based solutions. Once again, they're all interconnected. You can't do a nature-based solution unless you understand the benefit that's gonna be driven for it. So you need to have some understanding of the impact and dependency, the capital stock there in order to be able to do a good nature-based solution. 
So we're not talking about different things here. And I think that's really important to put out. And I know that IUCN and Gerard Boss particularly has been leading a lot of the work around those connections between this. And the nature-based solutions work that IUCN done is brilliant. It really is worth taking a look at. But you need to also have that understanding of capitals and these other parts to make sense of it and to really apply it well. All right, well understood, Mark and, um, and, and Alberto. And here there is another interesting question, a little bit linked to, to what you just said. Biodiversity loss combined with massive monoculture agriculture puts humanity at enormous risk. Viruses threaten not only humans, but our livestock and plants. Is enough being done to encourage small scale farms with diverse crop and livestock? What do you think about this? I think it's a very good question. Uh, whether there is enough being done, I hope so. Um, it will depend a, a lot on, on how seriously this strategy is being implemented. Um, I completely agree um, that we need more diversity, a genetic diversity as well in our agricultural production. It's a little bit, um, you know, this that there is always this parallel being drawn between um, how we approach the, the, the classical capital, like when you have your financial portfolio, you want to diversify it. You will not bat on one horse if you want to be sure that you still keep something, some, some win uh, for yourself. Uh, you need a healthy diversified portfolio of your investments to be sure that you have a secure future unless you're a really risky hazard, you know, um, gambling, gambler <laughs> sort of person. Uh, I don't think it's very wise to gamble like that with, with nature. Uh, in nature, we also need a variety of species to make sure that if there is a disaster, a disease, um, a parasite uh, that, uh, wipes out one species, we still have alternatives. So if we invest in um, just one type of crops, and this is actually happening, I mean, you go to your supermarket, you have two or maximum three types of apples. Well, where is that rich variety of apples that used to be there when I was a child in communist Poland? It's gone. Uh, I see the, 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 the Granny Smith and maybe two other red varieties. Uh, I don't think it's very wise. Bananas are another example. A, few, a, a couple of years ago, there was a, a disease uh, that was affecting bananas and there was a, a whole alarm in the press that we're going to lose all our bananas because we only have one variety, predominant, um, with some niche uh, um, varieties uh, here and there. So I completely agree this is crucial. And that's also what we are trying to achieve with preserving diversity biodiversity. Um, so it's not only the amount of nature, but also the, the variety. Now the small farmers, um, it's very interesting when we talk to, to the farmers, the big farmers tend to say it's impossible, you will starve the world, it's too expensive, we need our pesticides, we need intensive agriculture, uh, we, we cannot sacrifice any more land to landscape features for bees, it can't be done. When you talk to the small farmer, they are more open to that. I think there are ways to do it. Um, it requires maybe a different approach. It requires maybe a shift in pricing. It, 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 it needs an adjustment to maybe pay the farmer for the service to the environment that they, that they do. Because they, through farming, contribute to other things as well. They contribute to healthy soils for generations. They contribute to clean air. They contribute to a variety of different services. It's not only the provision of the food. They are really the guardians of, uh, of biodiversity. And I think that needs to be recognized. But again, it brings, brings us to that debate about how we value those services and that we not only pay for the product, but also for the whole range of other services that farmers provide. 
but okay, I will not monopolize. Yeah, we are, let, let's go deeper about, on this because I think this, it, this is where it's getting a really tricky and we're touching a trade union core issues. So on the um, diversity of the crops, when I go to the supermarket, uh, to the supermarket, the Granny Smith comes from elsewhere except Europe. And by the way, it's a, it's a, I think it's, a, it's an apple that is, uh, it's, it has been, um, not if it's not genetically modified, but mod, but modified in a way to be the Granny Smith. So, but that's a diff very different uh, uh, conversation, combined with the um, synthetic biology, which is another aspect that perhaps we could uh, talk about an, another time. But the issue is about how to support small farmers. We know that when they are invited to transform their um, their farms from uh, normal agriculture to organic agriculture. It is indeed expensive, as Kalorina said. It is difficult. They have to fight with their uh, colleagues, which are surrounding. They are a whole community in small villages in France, Belgium, wherever they are in Spain. It is not easy. And they have to wait two years with zero uh, revenue from their transformation. So how, how can these uh, happen in a sustainable way that farmers are not only encouraged by the political decisions, but also by by other type of uh, resources that they can just feel um, feel uh, uh, comfortable to do this, and that there is enough um, guarantees that uh, perhaps the European Commission or the national member states can support this transformation. If I may, I think there's there's um. <clears throat> This is a very complex issue and we've tried several times to manage um, working with smaller to medium farmers and enterprises etc and it is always challenging but there's an awful lot going on around the food uh, system space we're running work in seven different countries around the world mexico brazil china india uh, food systems change at the moment um, there's also this is the year of the food summit we've also got the op2b which is the one planet for business and biodiversity which is set up which is a lot of the bigger companies but looking to pass it down through supply chains but there are some market mechanisms as well and i think we've seen this with financial institutions more recently getting behind this so with Rabobank and with abn amaro in the netherlands we've been looking at how we can engage specifically with small to medium farmers and enterprises and there's, what, there's one just very quickly I wanted to explain to you that we've come across, which is if we take a piece of land, if we get a building, in the built environment, what we do is we have a, a triple repairing lease. So if you're renting a flat and you do some damage to it, you have to pay. You lose your deposit, don't you? That's what happens when we rent a property. Why don't we do that with land? So there's certain landowners that are starting to do this. What you do is you do soil sampling at the beginning of the process. And you then set out a contract for the, because a lot of land, most land, particularly small farmers is leased. You then have this contract with the farmers that if they increase, uh, if they destroy the quality of the soil, i.e. all of the nutrients go out into the products in the supermarket shelves, et cetera, then they um, lose their deposit. They have to pay more, but you've got to put the carrot in as well. So what you do is, is if the quality of the soil increases, it incentivizes them to actually use organic processes then what you would do is you would share that benefit as well. And this comes completely back to capital. You have the land capital, the capital resource that you've got there, and then you have the flow, which is the revenue that's coming off it. So it's exactly what I was showing before, capital and flow, okay? If the capital increases and you get a stronger capital, you can share that because it's gonna go on in pituitary forever because you're building up this stock of resources in the soil. So share that with the landowners, that's how we incentivize them. It's a market mechanism that can be supported by legislation and regulation and other things. We need all of that as well. But I think there are market mechanisms out there that we should be thinking about that can support that in that public private um, realm. Yes. Uh, well, I, I can't agree more with uh, what was said now by Mark and also what Carolina was uh, mentioning in relation with the market anomalies also. Uh, we need to remember that while we have these challenges in the markets, at the same time, agriculture is the main threat to biodiversity in the European Union in general. So at the same time, of course, it's fundamental. It's not only producing food, it's also producing or ensuring that we have vibrant uh, rural areas. We need to have a good agricultural system. Uh, now, we need to remember that at the same time, 37% of the European budget goes to the common agricultural policy. So it's a, the most important bit of the European budget is going for this. So there, is, there are resources. Let us also remember, and just adding facts here, most of this budget is going to a small number of farmers. So there is not really a distribution that is perfect here. 
Well, some issues that could help here or some potential ideas for the future. First of all, the, what uh, Mark also was mentioning in his presentation at the beginning, we have we need to have the natural capital really accounted for in a, in a good way. At the moment, it's invisible in a number of decisions related with finance, and that's causing a number of anomalies. That's not helpful. Now, at the same time, what if we have all this support and we have this need to go to a different model, maybe these budgets will be mainly focused on this, what we are speaking all the time about this just transition to help to go in another direction. Now it's not exactly happening in this way. And the current discussions not, don't, do not seem to be in the direction of making a fundamental change, but we have the opportunity now. We really have the opportunity to make these changes. So the next one year, one year and a half during the trialogue, let's see how long it is, is probably the fundamental test to see if we are really serious, let's say. Okay, very, very well understood, uh, uh, Mark, um, Carolina, and Alberto. But uh, again, um, going more into a trade union related world, why should trade unions be more focused on biodiversity protection? Still, our, our question is still, there are two very different worlds. What can you say about that? I think that one's very simple. There's no jobs on a dead planet. All right. It's a. It's a. It's, it really, let's get into uh, another part of our conversation. Um, does someone would like to go more into examples of natural capital accounting that could speak uh, to European trade unions in a way that they could get inspired or find other type of resources? Uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll respond to that. And, and sorry if my last comment was taken a bit flippantly. I, I, obviously, it's more complex than that, but uh, I think there is something in that as well. The, so there are there's an awful lot of resources to help um, organisations to understand their natural capital. What the coalition has done has been bringing together all of that community in order to be able to do it. The European Business and Biodiversity Platform is a wonderful resource that has lots of materials in it. They're just developing a biodiversity wheel at the moment, which will be part of a, a broader tool that we've done with all of those different tools and resources that you can find. So very easily navigatable to find the one that is relevant for you. I think there is a, a, a big connection here though, back down to people and to resources and, and, the, and how biodiversity does fit into that. Because just taking one example on oceans, um, we think of plastics in the oceans as being an environmental problem. Um, and uh, I need to mention oceans as well because it's often forgotten. We always talk about the terrestrial issues and yet most of our protein, most of our actually resources come from the oceans originally. So we need to, and a lot of the carbon sequestration comes from oceans and yet we tend to forget about it because it's not on the land that we stand on. But in the oceans, this plastic problem is seen as being environmental and yet it's actually connected back to how we treat people. And the reason why plastics end up in the oceans is because we have slavery, we have modern day slavery, we have um, um, people not paying people properly, we don't look after our people, and that's why a lot of these plastics are ending up in the ocean. So it's a social problem that is deep leading to an environmental um, issue here. And if we can't see those connections, we're never going to be able to um, manage or solve either, any, either of those problems there. But there's a lot more resources on our website, capitalscoalition.org. On there, you can find not only a toolkit, which takes you through different tools, but there's also a community where you can go in and ask those questions. I think this is really key. We've got, more recently, we just started this up. We've got people coming in asking very specific questions of the global community, and they're able to come together and help to find solutions. And it's that collaboration where we can find solutions together to those problems that's going to be key here. Thank you, Mark. Anyone would like to, to step in? Can I just say one more thing, actually? The, um, the national level accounts is going to be really important here as well. So the United Nations Statistical Department at the moment, and I think the European decision was actually yesterday, but I haven't found out where this is, is but they're moving towards a standard for how we do national accounts. And that may seem very, seem very big uh, and not necessarily relevant to individuals. But it really is, because if we start thinking about how we value our societies, the value that people and the, the world that we live in, rather than GDP, which we all know there's been problems with and challenges with, it does its job that it was set out to do, but it, it doesn't really account for the value that we have. 
if we can start changing that, which is what the statistical departments in the European Union and around the world are now doing, when that becomes a standard in March, we'll now have a top-down approach. We'll start saying, well, we've got to take account of nature and people a little bit later on in that process. If we do that at that level, and then we can see that there's already movement in finance. Olam, a big agricultural company from Singapore recently, has got preferential finance. It's got cheaper money because it was able to identify its risks and opportunities better because it was understanding capitals, this capital concept. It got cheaper finance. Now, if money's flowing in the right direction, that's a good thing. We've then got businesses, and we've talked about the issue around not just those big businesses, but small to medium uh, farmers and enterprises as well have got to be part of this. But it's got to be that whole picture. And I think that international approach, I mean, for businesses, there is the natural capital protocol, which brings together the 40 different approaches that were there into one harmonized approach. We've dealt with the, um, the complexity of this. There is one approach that is being applied by most businesses around the world now that are, are applying capitals. So I think that there is um, more cohesion, more uh, advancements here than we think. And we've, I think seeing this at the national level, the regional level, like in Europe, and then the uh, business and finance together is where we're gonna see uh, the most traction when they all work together. Thank you, Mark. And I am speaking about growth. Sorry, uh, Carolina, you wanted to say something? Yes, uh, if I may, but per perhaps you want to finish your sentence first. No, because it's another question. So please oh, right. go ahead. No, I just I just wanted to add on uh, to what Mark was saying um, to to that question: Why is uh, nature protection, biodiversity important for um, for trade unions? Um, I think it has. What, I, what I'm trying to say has to do a lot with those inequalities that Mark uh, is also uh, talking about a lot. And it's quite shocking to see that um, sometimes it's not possible for people who don't have enough income to afford healthy environment. If you look at the correspondence between pollution and wealth, there is a clear link. People who are richer live further from highways, we live further from polluted areas, they have access to organic food, they have access to cleaner water. I mean, this is, uh, from my perspective, completely unacceptable. And these are actually people who have less impact on the environment. If you look at it globally, it's the, the difference is even starker. The countries with a very small footprint per capita live in very squalid conditions and are affected by the production that we are consuming. And that is a huge problem globally. I think these inequalities, they have to be addressed and everyone should have the right to clean air, to clean water and to healthy food without um, additives, without pesticides, etc. And uh, that I think should feature more prominently perhaps in uh, the cause of the trade unions, because it's not only, um, you know, the right to health is linked to the right to clean environment. You cannot be healthy without clean environment. And to have clean environment, you need your um, your, your, um, your businesses, you need uh, your governments to do the right things. So I think that is where I would see the, the strongest um, link perhaps. Um, because uh, then of course, uh, if you look at biodiversity globally, I think there is also very strong links to uh, inequality between men and women, et cetera, the women's rights. Uh, women often deal more um, with biodiversity, with nature in, uh, in developing countries and so on, but that's not so much in Europe, uh, that context, I think. But the health uh, uh, links and the links between access to clean environment and, um, and the wealth are still quite important also here. Thank you, Carolina. Um, sorry, Alberto, just go ahead, please. It will be very short, but just an addition that can help also here. Um, because the health issue, it's what Carolina was mentioning, is fundamental. And there is also a relation between health and inequalities. Living in areas with green spaces significantly reduces income-related health inequalities. 
And that's something to keep in mind always. I think that what is probably important is to not call the challenges related with financing of the uh, biodiversity needs, let's call it this way. We don't call it a cost, we call it an investment. Because actually what we do when we are helping biodiversity is helping the whole of society for a number of uh, very different issues, including health, but including also jobs and uh, better well-being, which at the very end is going to help us to address issues even such as the current pandemic. I think that's really important. There's a project we just started with SHIFT, which is about human rights in the US, but it's about living wage. And there's been lots of studies, lots of uh, different opinions on whether we should pay living wages or not. But the reason why most organizations don't pay a living wage is because they put it on their accounts at the end of the year as a cost. So when you actually look at your accounts at the end of the year, you say, do I want my costs to go up or down? Well, you want them to go down, don't you? So you're not gonna add it in. If, and this is the whole point of our project, if like oil and gas exploration, which for all, for many, many years now, oil and gas exploration has been put into accounts as a research and development cost, as an investment. It's not put in as a cost. Any research and development looking for oil and gas is put in as an investment, it's not put in as a cost. If we put in people as an investment, we invest in our people and we get brilliant returns and they get returns as well. If we put that in, just change it in the accounting rules, that little bit, and we change the way that we pay people. That is quite astounding that we can have that small change in accounting rules to see a significant change in the, the benefits for people and for the planet there. And yes, I, perhaps, ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Just one example that I forgot to, to give, but I don't have the name of the study in my head now. Quite recently, I read about the, the correlation between the, the, the IQ of children and the accessibility to green areas. I mean, how can we accept the fact that if you don't have enough money to live in a green area, your child will have less chances in the future? This is, this is, this is crazy. And I think this is really where we should uh, fight for, for right to live in green, healthy, uh, unpolluted areas. The same goes for air pollution, huge correlations with mental health, with how early you get your Alzheimer's, with how well you perform at school. Uh, same goes for noise, and it's all related to nature. And, uh, and it's, it's uh, something that um, we should highlight much more. Yeah, so I, I want yes, yes, please Alberto. This will be really short. I just think that uh, also being practical, which is also important for people listening to us now for sure. Uh, there is a, um, a project that we are running that has a couple of uh, very practical tools that might be helpful. Um, we have some training models on natural capital through the project We Value Nature, which is helping to introduce the concept of natural capital, but most importantly, to provide practical and concrete guidance on how a company can begin to approach a first natural capital assessment. So these kind of tools exist already and can be, I would say, a very practical first step for companies to start to move in this direction. And can I just clarify, We Value Nature is a campaign of the Capitals Coalition as well. So it's very much connected. It's the starting point for companies to come into the community that we're hosting here, run by IUCN, World Business Council for Sustainable Development and OPLA, and ICAW, sorry, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. Are trade unions involved in these type of projects, Mark? Definitely. So, um, the, uh, in fact, on our board, we have um, uh, Victor from the International Labour Organization. We have trade unions. And but this is something that's come about more recently, I think, in the last couple of years. I think there was a division between social science and environmental science um, up until only a couple of years ago. And we found it very difficult to get those two people into the same room together. They were talking different languages and the trade unions didn't want to sit down with the environmentalists, they, you know, and vice versa. Um, I think that that, that that barrier is being broken down and that's exactly being seen by today and that the fact that there's a, a session being run on biodiversity. I mean, I don't think we would have seen this on the agenda a couple of years ago, but it is an important issue to trade unions and they can see that actually it does have an impact upon the quality of of their, um, the, the people in the union, um, their health, et cetera, as we've been saying here. So yes, we do have quite a lot of new people from trade unions and from uh, youth groups and from other parts of society joining the coalition at the moment. 
That's great to hear. And we do hope that other European trade unions can go into this type of projects. But as you have said, now trade unions are more uh, in, involved in the, in the narrative of biodiversity and they do recognize its importance, not only within this conference, but I was reading the position of EFAT where they are clearly, which is the trade union confederation related to agricultural um, matters, and they're clearly very, very well informed and embedded into the discussion at the political and, of course, at the national level. The danger is not that trade unions do not see biodiversity as important, but that it can be difficult to persuade trade union members, workers in agriculture, in fishery, that it is indeed important. When many rich people flew on with, with their wealth and media portraits companies, the greenwashing and greenwashing is a big danger because it can be it can go really really uh, deep into the policymakers the big ones the ones like Carolina making the laws and uh, they can influence politics in ways that are are, are not really um, helpful for the workers what are what are your views about the, the danger of greenwashing I think we have to start by calling it multicolored washing now not just green because it happens across everything. Um, I, th I think also that, I mean, there is actually legislation in the EU at the moment around um, green claims. So if you make a claim about something and the proposal is to base it around something called life cycle analysis, which is where you take a process and you follow it through. And, and most of the work that we do has some connection back to life cycle analysis. I think the thing is, is that what Capitals does is then take that into an integrated approach rather than it um, um, just being a life cycle approach. So it actually sees the interconnections between it. So you need both, you need both of that. But if that goes through the green claims, I think that there will be legislation to help to address a lot of uh, what, what you're talking about here. There's always gonna be people making claims on things, aren't there? There's always gonna be people saying, oh, mine is bigger, mine is, mine is greater. I think the main thing though at the core of this is that we should stop seeing businesses, governments and trade unions or whatever as just an entity in themselves. They're all made up of people. And the bit that I really get most excited about is um, being in a session like today and having these conversations or being with individuals and seeing light bulbs go on when they realize the connection between things. And it's, it is actually very easy to see that a green space, getting out and being in nature, biodiversity creates a greater sense of well-being, creates a greater sense of self, can help you. And everyone in those trade unions, everyone in the businesses and the governments it are people and we've got to connect to people on a people level not just as a um, branding everyone as being bad or good that isn't going to help us i do hope that at some point we will get away with green um whatever shade of green washing uh all together and everything will have to have uh, a certain minimum standard then of course you can have the creme de la creme, you know, the, the greenest uh, products or services in that range. But we should eliminate the dirty, the dirty bottom, because it really, I mean, it, green products should not be, we should not be forced to sell them. It, it should not be a sales strategy. There should be, everything should be green and, and doing no harm. And then, of course, you can compete on the, on, on the level whether or not something is, is, is better. But um, for, for now, I think there's too, still too many product services that do too much harm. Um, and for the green ones, it's still difficult to get through. Um, so in a way, it's maybe also unfair to to accuse them then on, on trying to promote that they made an effort. Um, but I, yes, I recognize that there is an issue with greenwashing. Uh, and as, as Mark said, we are from, from the product side and also the services side, uh, we are working on some sort of a basic methodology that companies would use to um, measure how green they are. Uh, so that uh, they can make that claim. Um, for organic, for instance, this, is, this has been regulated. So um, there is a, a very well-recognized label. Um, I think that greenwashing issues is probably much less uh, spread in, in the area of those products. So um, at least in Europe, it's, 
um, it's really a, a, a symbol, the, the little organic leaf that is uh, very well recognized uh, and, and well trusted. And we could have that for other products, not the green leaf, because that's for agriculture, organic products, but for, for other products. Right, we have very interesting questions here. Yeah, that, yes, is... please, uh, Alberto. Thanks a lot. So yes, uh, in this context, it's fundamental the, the work that, uh, for example, Mark is doing in, in relation with metrics or the natural capital accounting that we are all working on, the standard I was mentioning on nature-based solutions. All this is helping to avoid these kind of claims, if you want. But also I would like to say that maybe I wouldn't like to think or to leave the impression that greenwashing is a issue that is widespread and it's everywhere and every business is dealing with that or big company. This is just something that, yes, it happens, but uh, I think that everybody is trying to do their best. I would like to believe that, or at least a number of uh, companies that we are working with, definitely they are doing some things and it's important to highlight it. And also what uh, Mark was mentioning also before, we are all on this together. So we better find solutions that and we are from the beginning starting with the starting point is a matter of trust, if you want, of what we are trying to do, because we are in all this together. This is an issue that is affecting us as humanity, actually, it's not even European. So to thinking ways to solve it is probably much more constructive than to focus on the sometimes not imperfections of the system, if you want. Yes, it's, it's very nice to have a panel in which uh, the speakers say we are all in this together and we truly hope so. Um, isn't there a danger in monetizing the biodiversity question? Uh, the UK is a report that's Gustav from this week was heavily criticized by some as wanting to finance, fi finance, finance nature's fundamental importance for our well, well-being. What can you say about this? So this is a question I get probably seven times a day. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm very familiar with it. Um, there's a big difference between monetization and value. And what we've got to get back down to is what we're talking about here is value, the relative importance and worth of something. If I'm really thirsty, then water has greater value to me than if I'm not thirsty. So when we, when we as a community value something, then we actually put more investment into it. And monetization is just one form of value, okay? And we've written a piece actually, it took a long time to come together. One of the critics of this is actually a, a very strong critic is someone called George Monbiot, who's a journalist. And he often writes about this. He's actually quite often contradicted himself and said that there's positive things about it as well. But we wrote a letter to George, which is actually on our website and you can find that, Dear George, um, that actually we're not living in a monoculture. There is actually a lot of different approaches to this and we need those. Monetization can be really, really helpful if we're looking at a, in a business, a capex decision, which is when you're making an investment of some kind, you want to compare things. But actually a lot of the decisions we make are made around quantified or qualified information. But the most important thing is that we get away from just counting things like measurement and we actually get to the value of it, what it means to us. If we do that, that's what we're talking about all the time. And that's what Dasgupta was talking about as well. It's not just about monetization. That's a, that's a misconception of it. That's um, making the devil out of um, what people have said when actually what he's really talking about there is about the value being created. We're doing an event on the 25th of February as well with the World Wildlife Fund and with Business for Nature, which was set up um, to be able to do this. And in that event, we're gonna be looking at actually how we can apply that in real practice with businesses, with people on the ground, apply that review. And that review that came out actually was, we've got so much traction from it that actually we've had problems with our website because of it, because there's been so many people looking into solutions from then. So I think it is a bit of a groundbreaking stepping stone. It's like the Stern review was for climate. We've now got one for biodiversity, but please, please, please don't misconstrue this whole idea of price and money with value. What we're talking here about is value. Yeah, if I may add here, I have been in this discussion also for, I would say, practically 10 years. Probably don't receive that many questions that you do nowadays, Mark. <laughs> but I have been in this discussion for a long, long time. And it's a complex one, I have to say. It's uh, not always uh, easy to to find the best uh, solution. Definitely, we are not speaking about putting a price for nature. This is something that we should go up front. That's always there. It's not about putting a price for nature. But if we avoid to enter in the economic discussion, simply nature is invisible in decisions. And that's exactly what we try to avoid. And that's exactly where we are trying to go. We just make, need to make sure that when decisions are being taken, nature is part of it. 
is, is not accounted for. It's simply invisible. And therefore, decisions can be very detrimental, as they are, actually. This is the goal of this whole, the whole discussion about natural capital accounting. Let's keep it in mind. And it's like I was saying on the board papers I receive, it just gives me the financial reason to do something. It doesn't actually include this information. So it's about getting it into those decision papers that we have. Natural accountant, thank you so much. I have a couple of questions here because um, I really wouldn't like to lose them. And let's just move into the international realm. Biodiversity uh, population is growing everywhere in the world and uh, it's part of a mega trend. It, it will grow more. And how, how are we going to reconcile the biodiversity loss or restoration with population growth? We're talking about new generations, youth. What are we giving to our uh, young generations? And Brexit is part of this international aspect as well. And starting with the Brexit question, do you know if the UK is still fully engaged in these processes, given Brexit and the associated nationalistic flag waving, given that these are international issues? Um, if we can jump from the Brexit example to a more global international approach, including youth and population growth, I would love to hear that from you. Thank you. Um, I am, um, I suppose, as the British person on the panel, I should probably respond to that. Um, as you can, I mentioned at the beginning, we're now actually a Dutch foundation. We were originally in Netherlands. When I took over, we have been um, based in the UK for a while. We've still got lots of UK people. Um, to my mind, we have to work internationally and what um, is going on in Brexit and uh, some of the challenges that that throws up are going to be very difficult. I think we should be working internationally, collaboratively. As you can tell, everything I've said today has been about systems and that we need to work together. So you can probably tell where my politics lie on this. I think though that the UK is, and I, I had lots of people actually actually come to me after the desk up to review was review, uh, released, saying, oh, it's just the UK being imperialistic again. We've got to get over this. We've got to stop throwing stones. We've got to stop saying that. If the UK has come up with something which could be helpful, let's use it all of us to help us to go forward rather than saying it's not. And hopefully we can still have that special relationship between the UK where I'm still actually living, my children are still school here and Europe, and it doesn't have to be a barrier. I think we're gonna to have to get over some of the pain of this between us, but we have to find ways that some of the things that the common agricultural policy, which is obviously a very difficult issue, the steps being taken in the UK now that I think could be more positive actually around some of the issues there and about some of the incentive mechanisms and using natural capital there. Maybe we can all learn from that rather than blaming each other from it. And there's bound to be things that are going on in Europe that Britain should also be taking account of as well. So um, I did put my head in my hands when you asked that question there. <laughs> yeah, if I may also hear, yeah, going a little bit also beyond the UK, so more international perspective, also UK. Well, environmental issues are, of course, global issues. This is not just a European, definitely not just UK. So this is something that is uh, going um, all over the world. Uh, now, if you think in what is happening in the European Union in specifically, the European Green Deal is a great step. It's a great step in the right direction. For now, as I was saying before, is just paper, right? Well, there's a number of things happening, but in principle, there are lots of promises, let's say. And the question will be, will it work? The European Commission, we, we have now, the, not only from the Commission, the European Union has its new biodiversity strategy. And it's going to be the one that is prepared in advance to the global framework that will be presented later on this year in China, hopefully. So we are showing a little bit an example to the world, how the things could be done. Now, this is, I insist, how the planning should be done. The next step is how it will work. And this will include, as I said, also the resources. So now if we want to look serious in front of the world, we better show an example of how to actually make it happen. So any decision that now will not help the implementation of the Green Deal, and in particular the biodiversity strategy, will just be detrimental to the image of the European Union, if you want. And I would think that what is happening in the UK with some of the decisions that could be in another direction, like the agricultural policy discussions, well, again, they can be examples. I agree with uh, Mark that here we can try to learn from each other. And here there can be positive things here, negative things there. At the very end, the world is watching, let us say. The rest of the world is in more difficult situation than we are. And if we don't do the things properly, we might have challenges to make or convince anybody that the things will be in this way. Uh, 
Uh, perhaps just to add, I, I, I fully agree with the, with the previous speakers. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not too concerned actually about uh, the, the relationship between the EU and uh, the United Kingdom uh, on biodiversity issues. I think the UK has always been quite progressive there. There's a very strong uh, appreciation of nature in the UK. That's my personal perception. There are some icons of nature uh, protectors like the Sir David Attenborough, Prince Charles. I mean, if you listen to the opening speech that Prince Charles made at the launch of the Desgupta Review, and by the way, I'm not sure whether the audience is familiar with the Desgupta Review, perhaps <laughs> not, then maybe we should explain what it is. Um, that, is uh, that is fantastically progressive. Um, and I think we will see that coming together this year uh, because we will have two conferences um, of the parties, two COPs, mm. uh, one in China on biodiversity and probably very close to that, uh, there will be a, um, a climate COP in Glasgow. And that is going to promote very strongly nature-based solutions. Um, we talked to the UK authorities uh, about how they want to go about this COP and there is going to be a very strong push on nature, not just afforestation um, to plant whatever trees, but done in a proper way. Uh, so I think there's a lot of synergies in that and, um, and I'm convinced we will speak with, with one voice in, in the negotiations. Also the UK uh, joined uh, the Leaders' Pledge uh, for Nature. Uh, they signed it together with von der Leyen, um, uh, with Ursula von der Leyen. So I think it's really we negotiated it together, uh, the text, uh, so we still work closely uh, on, uh, on these aspects. It's a pity though that it's not uh, in one team, but uh, um, I think we are not uh, having different points of views there. So we're expecting big news this year in both sides of the world and uh, trade unions, I suppose they were, will be very interesting of the outcomes and the process. But how to bring really trade unions in the sailing boat of biodiversity, uh, the political level, but also at the ground and sea level? Do you have more... Um, more practical um, insights about this. It's still difficult to bring them in. I think if, uh, um, if I may, the, the um, uh, trade unions are obviously connected through to the organizations and the businesses that they're working in. And we've seen a massive change in the last um, couple of years as well with businesses now uh, starting to try and address this. I'm not saying they've got all the solutions. I'm not saying they're doing it all right. But there is within most of those organizations now, there is a hub of people that do want to see transformation and change. OK, so within those trade unions, find those people in your organization. If they're not there, create it, create that green team or whatever it is you want to do and be the heart. Why can't it be the trade union that is leading the charge around biodiversity there within the organization? It should be. It's about people. It's about nature. It's about the things that are core for trade unions. So in most of these organizations, there's a, there's a, a nub of it. And I think this comes back to the international question. The question isn't normally between countries. It's actually sometimes within the country that you, we have different departments, different um, parts of the organization going to some of these big international conferences compared to other parts of the um, organization or the government that is actually arguing for certain things. It's the same in business. You'll have the sustainability team and uh, finance team maybe arguing that they want to do things differently and positively. And then you'll have the public affairs team arguing about that they um, want to have, keep things as they are. So those differences within the team is where the trade unions can really play a role because they bring together a single voice within those organizations. Thank you, Mark. Yes, sorry, Carolina. Um, we have businesses today that are um, probably more powerful than governments, uh, especially in terms of uh, income. I mean, look at the, the big tech, uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. Um, these are the wealthiest entities in the world. And within those businesses, trade unions are extremely powerful. 
So in that way, there's a huge leverage that trade unions could have on changing the way things are for the environment. Alberto, we're looking at each other, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. It's the virtual world doesn't allow to cross eyes, but yes, I guess so. <laughs> so just, uh, um, well, at the very end, what we are looking for when it's about uh, biodiversity protection and environmental issues in general and social perspective, it's, uh, it's not that different, let's say. If we will have a fair world, if you want, a just uh, world, probably the environmental issues will be also easier to handle. At the very moment, uh, one of the issues that is uh, affecting, is fundamental for the uh, environmental issues is the consumption that is actually mentioned also in, in, in one of the questions. Well, um, it's probably not very politically correct to speak about uh, questions or to mention simply questions that might be difficult to tackle, such as, well, are we consuming too much? Are we having a world that is not exactly good for us as we are doing the things in the economic system that we have? Well, maybe that's a question where we could find even confluences from the social and from the environmental perspective. And I think that uh, at the very end, actually, this is uh, what we have to do. This is, uh, we have mentioned it a number of times, but we are having serious challenges and we better find solutions that are good for all. And we better find them quickly, by the way because uh, we are facing now crisis that could actually kill us. Let's be very clear here. So, well, I, I think that uh, the confluence of the social and environmental issues is a must at the moment, not just uh, how we do it, but we need to do it. And we are actually finding it. And the simple fact that we have this session here is already helpful. I think that there is a number of fora that uh, maybe we don't find the trade unions that much that many times, and maybe it's good to start to also invite them or have them there uh, also so in their point of view. Thank you, Alberto, and thank you, everyone. And it has been a fantastic conversation, but I wouldn't like to close it without really final statements or closing words from your side. Please, Carolina, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, for biodiversity and for nature, because I'm sure it's not really for us. <laughs> and um, I think, for, to me, the, the questions that were uh, in the chat uh, that we unfortunately didn't have the time to address all of them show very clearly that um, people know what is at stake and that it's really a very big stake that we have to tackle together. So I think my final remark would be, uh, please do make your voices heard because uh, that part of the society, I think that trade unions are very influential and I think you can make a big change. Marco. I, I would just support that. I mean, you have a very strong voice um, and coming together as a community as you do through trade unions and um, use that power um, for, you know, for both biodiversity, nature and people. Alberto Arroyo, Schnell. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, yes, uh, we are here to learn from each other. So I think it's fantastic that you are there. I hope that this was interesting. Uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you that uh, only three days ago, we received a letter in our office from a small girl, nine years old from Spain, a small village. And she was asking for some pictures about animals for her project in the school. It was like a perfect reminder of what we are here for. This is about the future. This is about uh, making something good for the next generations. It's in our hands and we need to leave a better world for those that we follow. And this includes, of course, the social issues and of course, the environmental side. So hopefully we can make it together. Thank you. Biodiversity is on our hands and it is on our hands to make it visible for the future generation. Thank you to our audience for this fantastic uh, conversation. And on behalf of ETUI, I wish you a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we are offline. Thank you, really. I'm very sorry that we couldn't go through the conversations. 
um, it was really fantastic. And I hope that we can have uh, other lev uh, another level of involvement between the commission and Marx and uh, Alberto Arroyo. Thank you very much, really. Thank, Thank you. you really interesting. <laughs> well done.